This conference will now be recorded. Welcome and thank you for joining the sixth chapter in our monthly Cybersecure Canada webinar series. Today, the topic is secure, sorry, securely configured devices featuring Richard Yard of Data Perceptions as our industry guest speaker. My name is Brendan Dumphy. I am the Director of Trust and Compliance with CyberNB, and I will be your host today. For the new participants joining today, I will do a brief overview of Cybersecure Canada and then turn the presentation over to our industry guest speaker who will be presenting on securely configuring devices. This webinar will be recorded. Participants can ask questions via the chat box. Uh, we will address questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation, time permitting, of course. Uh, any questions that don't get addressed, though, can be asked via email to contact us at dataperceptions.com or info at cybernb.ca. So let's get started. The focus of CyberNB's Trust and Compliance program is to help organizations of all sizes operate safely in the digital economy. Canadian businesses must ensure their systems, operational processes, and data are secure. This is especially true for small and medium-sized companies, which often lack the resources that larger organizations have to continually monitor for threats. CyberNB connects businesses of all sizes with accreditation bodies and certification bodies so that they can mitigate risk and obtain required certification. Our trust and compliance initiatives include liaising with national and international certification bodies, helping businesses obtain required certification or accreditation, promoting best practices in assessing vulnerabilities and threats, expanding market opportunities to compete in supply chains that require accreditation. For more information on trust compliance programs and initiatives, visit our website, cybernb.ca forward slash trust and compliance. So what is Cyber Secure Canada? Well, Cybersecure Canada is a voluntary cybersecurity certification developed by the Federal Government of Canada. It was designed with the following goals in mind. To improve Canada's small and medium organizations' cybersecurity baseline. To raise awareness and educate all Canadians about cybersecurity. And increase consumer confidence in the digital economy of Canada. It is based on the 13 control areas found in the baseline cybersecurity controls for small and medium organizations, shown here on the slide. For example, backup and encryption, or sorry, backup and encrypt data. Ensure business critical data is backed up to facilitate quick recovery from an incident. Employee awareness training. As a first line of defense, organizations should train employees on basic cybersecurity practices. And our topic of today, securely configured devices. For the sake of time, I will not go too in depth with all controls today. For more details on each control topic, please visit our website, cybernb.ca forward slash trust compliance and select the learn more button under the Cybersecure Canada section. Default administrative passwords and insecure default settings on devices are a significant problem in enterprise networks. Vendors and even resellers often configure devices with default administrative passwords, passwords which often become public. For secure configuration, Cybersecure Canada recommends organizations should ensure that they change all administrative passwords on all devices should review device settings, which may be set to insecure defaults, to disable all unnecessary functionality and enable any necessary security features. Organization, organizations may want to consider adopting secure product configuration profiles, such as the Center for Internet Security Benchmarks, or contacting an IT service provider to, to do so on their behalf. So what are the control requirements under secure configure devices? 
this uh, control topic only has one control requirement, and it is baseline control 4.1. Organizations should implement secure configurations for all of their devices, changing all default passwords, turning off unnecessary features, and enabling all relevant security features. So how do you get started? Well, that's really easy. Just navigate to our website, cybernb.ca forward slash trust and compliance, and select the Get Started button right under the Cyber Secure section. This will direct you to our secure online portal. From here, you can register to process the Cybersecure Canada certification requirements. Our portal is powered by Microsoft Azure and utilizes their robust security functionalities, as well as multi-factor authentication. To register, select the register button on the right of the screen. Registration to the portal is $350 plus tax. This provides access to the portal, which will clearly demonstrate the control requirements, as well as what is required for supporting evidence to support the control. When completing the certification requirements in the portal, you'll be presented with a series of statements. We refer to them as statements due to by selecting implemented, you are attesting that your statement, that the statement is true and your organization has implemented this control. The example on the slide is statement 11, which provides compliance for baseline control 1.3. Organizations shall consider purchasing a cybersecurity insurance policy that includes coverage for incident response and recovery activities, or provide a rationale for not purchasing one. So by clicking implemented, your organization would be stating that that statement is true. And the evidence required below would be provide your organization's cybersecurity insurance policy certificate or the rationale for not purchasing insurance. You'll also notice that the submit for certification button is grayed out on the screen. You will not be able to submit for certification review until you have completed all 51 required statements for Cybersecure Canada certification. When you complete all the statements, the button will light up and allow you to submit for certification review. Once you submit, you'll be contacted to choose one of the four accredited Cybersecure Canada certification bodies you would like to review your submission. The cost of certification review is set by the selected certification body. Cybersecure Canada accredited certification bodies include Bulletproof Solutions, Cybersecurity Canada, Source Tech IT, and WhatsApp Cyber Risk Management. At any step along the way, should you require assistance, you can request a practitioner to provide you with professional implementation guidance and support. They can assist you with all aspects from general implementation questions, all the way up to implementing all the required compliance controls and completing the certification submission for you. For example, Data Perceptions uh, has quite a bit of experience doing this as well. Save on cyber insurance. We are very pleased to announce uh, an agreement with Hub International and CyberNB. This agreement with Hub will ensure all organizations processing cyber, uh, cyber certification through our secure online portal will not only be eligible for cyber security insurance, but will also receive a 10% premium discount off of cyber insurance standard rates. It underscores the point that cyber insurance is a must have and not just a standalone protection. Your other business policies from professional liability to umbrella coverage may have gaps in how well they protect you. Cyber insurance can close those gaps. Cyber insurance is an extremely important component to ensure business continuity. By transferring some of the financial risks associated with cyber incidents, the impact on the organization's production and reputation will be marginal as expenses to support recovery, business interruptions, ransomware attacks will be covered. Please visit our website for more information on the insurance offering. Again, that's cybernb.ca forward slash trust and compliance. 
Now, as part of our monthly partner spotlight series, we will be showcasing a specific partner and their unique offering in the Cybersecure Canada program. November's partner spotlight features Data Perceptions. Data Perceptions is a managed service provider that provides a wide range of cybersecurity consulting services, including sec security assessments. They have been providing practitioner support for national cybersecurity certification frameworks for as long as Canada has had such offerings. CyberMB is proud to list them among our trusted managed service providers. Data Perceptions also has a unique perspective, being the first organization to achieve Cybersecure Canada certification. Oops. Sorry about that. We have a partner spotlight page on our website showcasing Data Perception specific offerings in this space, as well as a blog featuring that was co-written by Data Perception's own Richard Yard and Scott Murphy. Please visit our website to check it out. Now I'd like to introduce our industry guest speaker, Richard Yard of Data Perceptions. Richard is a senior consultant, security and operations practice lead and instructor for the Cybersecure Canada Certification Program. Richard has developed an information security assessment and consulting practice across a broad spectrum of industry sectors, including healthcare, financial, aerospace, automotive services and suppliers, communication services, and others. Richard is an instructor and examiner for Canada's Cybersecure Canada Certification Program for businesses and security practitioners. Richard has an extensive experience in developing and managing IT infrastructures for some of Canada's leading companies, both as a manager director and a consultant. He has focused on he has focused on building IT infrastructures which best fit the goals, objectives, and concerns of the organizations. So now I will turn it on over to Richard. Hi, hi. hello. I'm just going to bring up my screen here. Sure, and I want. Perfect. I can see it. You can see it. It's great. Okay, fantastic. So today's talk, uh, uh, Brendan just went through some of the things that I do. And so today I'm just gonna be focusing on the uh, securely configured devices, which might seem pretty simple when you first look at it, but it's, there's a little more to it than just that. So, um, so as uh, Brendan said, I am a, uh, information, a lead the information security practice at Data Perceptions. Uh, we handle, uh, uh, help companies with certifications and we do everything ISO, uh, ISO 27001, CMM, CMMC now, uh, we're doing, um, uh, NIST 171 particularly, and uh, we obviously we've been helping people with the Secure Canada certifications as well. And I not only do I help people with certain, uh, getting their certifications, I am also an instructor. We just completed one uh, last week. And um, I think I got another one next month uh, where we go through uh, and bring people up to the speed where they can also help companies uh, 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 meet the C uh, Secure Canada certifications, help be a practitioner, help companies through that process. And I enjoy doing that because I am able to, to pass on a lot of information beyond just cybersecurity Canada requirements. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the first thing you do when you're gonna secure a device is you gotta figure out what devices you have. Um, at first thought, this we're all familiar with routers and switches and servers and all that stuff, but it's not, it's not as easy as you first thought when you start getting into it. Here's our standard fare. We have our switches, our printers, our wireless devices. That seem okay. But in my experience going through uh, this whole process with different companies over the years, we found a little more out there than just that. So we started, uh, so we started seeing tablets, mobile devices, um, 
that that grade device with a drill on it, that's a CNC machine. They're all connected to the network. Um, we saw the external cameras. We had time clocks. Um, we have uh, uh, fingerprint identifiers. Um, auto update, I'll leave for that. But now we're starting to see this thing called SASE. And for what people, for people who don't understand what SASE is, SASE is the process now of taking the firewall that you used to have on-prem and at your different locations, and you're actually taking that and cloud, cloudifying that that uh, firewall. The device may be still there, but the instructions on the configuration of the device does not happen on the device any longer. It now happens in the cloud. And the nice thing about that is you write the rule runs, and it handles VPN devices. Um, high-end devices, low-end devices. There's only one rule written, and all those devices now pick up that rule from the cloud. Uh, and with the everybody working at home, I have done a lot of imp implementations with this uh, with SASE implementations, especially with a company called Cato. Um, uh, for our organization, we don't recommend any product. We are not a reseller. We're purely a consultant. Uh, so if I mention something, it's because I'm I have experienced it, not because I would I resell it or anything like that. And along then after that, we started seeing a bunch of other devices. And this is all the stuff you see here is stuff that we have found in assessments. You you have a, a, a grocery dispensing machine. We have uh, uh, plugs and and, and uh, light bulbs. I even had one organization where the guy plugged his Tesla into the network so that he can get updates while he's in the office. It's his company. He can do whatever he wants with it. But as uh, when I'm doing an assessment, I have to count it as a device because it's connected to the network. Um, on the, the uh, As we go through the bottom row, we got the switches. We have pumps now that are actually Wi-Fi connected so they can give information back to whoever is managing those devices. The last two on the right, I want to bring specifically attention to. Uh, the second one, the second last one from the bottom row from the right, that's a um, medicine dispensing machine that you have in hospitals. I had the occasion to, uh, was doing some work a few years ago the admin department bought the device, plugged, uh, connected up, and didn't realize that those devices that they purchased had Wi-Fi capability. Imagine what would have happened if a bad guy came around, got the default password, he was able to connect. It could have been, it could have been uh, catastrophic. Anyway, the, the IT got a wind of it, and they were able to mitigate that, process, that, that issue. The one, the last one on the bottom right, that's a an aquarium pump, and you can say, what is, <laughs> why? would I add an aquarium pump to this list? Well, it so happened that aquarium pump had a Wi-Fi capability. It was being monitored for water quality and all, all that stuff. The bad, that was in the casino. The bad guys were able to connect to that water pump and exfiltrate all the data stored in the company, these casinos database over a period of six months. So that little instant little uh, uh, aquarium pump was a very dangerous thing to that casino. Uh, the last two things that I've seen hooked up is uh, people have hooked up their uh, Amazon, their Google uh, devices uh, to networks. It, they use it at home, they bring it in the office, they plug it in. And the last one on the right there, your smart TV. Well, there's things about smart TVs, for especially for small businesses that they don't understand. Typically, a large organization will order a, a, a monitor that's a large uh, TV light monitor. Well, that monitor has certain features disabled. Uh, and so they cost more. And so there's a reason why they cost more. And there's a reason why large companies buy those devices as opposed to the TV from Best Buy. Smaller organizations will go over to Best Buy, buy a TV and plug it in. The issue with TVs are they are data collecting machines. And because the reason why they're so cheap is because there's information collected, that TV is collecting information about how many people are in the room, uh, when are they watching. There's a bunch of information that's being collected that's being resold by the manufacturers. And so while it might seem like an innocent little TV, it's also Wi-Fi connected. I've seen them connected to networks in their offices, but it's also collecting more information that you really might want to give up uh, to anybody. So when you start looking at this, when we started out with uh, 
uh, you know, your simple routers and switches and stuff. No, I have a whole bunch of stuff that people are connecting to networks, especially smaller organizations, and they could have a, there's, they can, there's real potential for harm if these the devices are not understood and controlled. So now that I've sort of opened your eyes of the things that I have actually seen on inf network infrastructures, we have to start to do something with this. <laughs> so the first thing everybody should do is create something called an asset register. Um, it will have a lot more stuff, but we were focusing on devices today. And what we're going to do is we are going to register everything that we can think of that's probably connected or if it's if it's connected and operational or connected and not operational. We don't care. We're going to list everything that we get our hands on. Uh, this this one here uh, is I use this for the for our certification when we did the Cyber Secure Canada because there's additional information that the Cyber Secure Canada controls ask for, and I have it all on one sheet. Makes my life a lot easier. But the, the point here is that some what you're going to do is you're going to list all those devices because you will forget. And if or if you leave the company, somebody else comes in, they're not going to know all the things that you've discovered. So you want to be able to document everything you found, and you're going to create some kind of an asset register. So once you've got that asset register done, now you're gonna have to, then you're gonna start to look at um, how we're gonna secure this device. The first thing I have to warn everybody about is something called beware of the beware of the tyranny of the default. That means that some devices come with default configurations, and if you follow those defaults, you can get yourself burnt. And um, for those vendors, uh, in this case, the Fortigate. The, the good example, the best example of this is the Fortigate VPN deployment. You can follow the standard uh, deployment process or the default deployment process, and you'll be in a world of hurt because 88% of all Fortigate VPN deployments were susceptible to man in the middle attack. And there is a little statement in the, uh, in the Fortigate manual, which most people didn't read, which then told you that you should basically deploy your own certificate that there's an issue with the device certificate. And if you had followed that little statement, you would not, you would not be one of those of the 88%. So you, you gotta be careful when you have a device, you make sure you understand what the default settings do and what the functions are and what the what attributes are enabled in the default setting. So, uh, and the other thing you want to do once you start to do this, create a little checklist of the, once you start, once you take that device out of that register and you're going to tackle that device because each device will have its own set of uh, attributes that you have to either configure or not or turn off or turn on or whatever. You're going to take that device and you're going to create a mini checklist for that device so that the next time you come back and for that device, you're, you're going to know exactly what you turned on and what you turned off and what you disabled. So create a little mini checklist. Then we get back to the same control statement as per the CSC uh, controls or Cyber Secure Canada controls. Uh, organizations shall implement secure configurations for all their devices changing all default passwords, turning off unnecessary features, and enabling all relevant security features. This is important because not only do you turn some off, but you also turn some on. So like we just said before, we're going to use our ad asset register to define, identify the device. What is it I'm going to be doing? We're going to confirm that the default password, if it does come one with one, that we've changed it. So that's the first thing on our checklist. Um, so then we're going to make sure it's running the current firmware. A lot of times you will get the device and it's two, three versions back. So you want to make sure that that device has the most current uh, firmware or if there's any additional updates or patches that came out since that device was uh, shipped to you, you want to make sure that all that stuff is applied because it can have an impact on security as well. Like I said before, we're going to review the default features and services. Now that we've applied all those updates, we're now going to look at the, uh, the default features, uh, the services, and the default uh, any default settings. So then you're going to put, create a little plan um, 
of services and features to be enabled or disabled. Like I said before, for that device, once you've got it all updated, and I'll talk a little bit about updates in a minute, um, you're gonna make sure that you understand and you document uh, those features that you're gonna enable and disable. A year later, when you go back to this device, you're gonna try to figure out what you did a year ago and you're not gonna remember. So just put it on a, a, a bullet point. You don't have to write a big long uh, uh, chapter <laughs> or episode, just bullet points so that you know what you did last time around. Um, we talk about disabling and enabling all the features. And the other thing is, if that device supports 2FA, or it supports a PIN or certificates or OTAP, you can deploy 2FA multiple ways. You make sure that you enable it. If it's, if it's there, if it's capable, uh, and if it doesn't cause, sometimes you get a device that to enable 2FA takes a whole whack of work. You might want to understand how much work it is, and if it's reasonable, then you enable it. So the other thing is now is uh, now that you got this device, <laughs> you've turned off the features, you got your checklist, you got all that stuff, you're ready to go. The other thing is once that is deployed, you have to make sure you keep it up to date. Um, so you want to make sure that you set up vendor notifications, and you make sure you want to get alerts on release updates um, or or patches. It is quite possible. Remember, there's a bad guy out there who is also understands. Um, what the vendor is doing, and if a patch is released, and that everybody knows about it, the good guys and the bad guys. So there's always a window between when a patch is released and when the bad guys have to deploy an attack. And they know that most organizations tend to take anywhere from two to six weeks to deploy an update. Well, the bad guy now has two to six weeks to attack or to develop an attack profile and attack the organization before they're able to implement those changes through the standard net normal standard deployment procedures. So they are very adept at making sure that they can attack before you uh, before you fix the advice. So therefore you want to be able to apply those passes as quickly as possible. Now there is from that device list you you would understand what is critical, what you might want to take precautions with, you, you will understand a whole bunch of things from that asset list. And it's okay, you add a column that talks about criticality. Yeah, this is a critical device. I'm gonna take a little more time with this device. But you have to, you want to deploy those patches or updates as quickly as possible to that device, knowing that the bad guy also knows about the, uh, about the vulnerability that uh, you're trying to patch as well. So once you got your critical stuff done or your important stuff, then you want to schedule, and, and what I'm saying is, uh, you want to deploy those critical things almost immediately. There's a, you have to balance two risks here. One risk is if I don't deploy it, the bad guy had, can take advantage of it. But if I deploy it, it might cause harm. My, my, my recommendation is if it's critical, uh, uh, apply it and then worry about if it's gonna cause me a problem. Because either way, you're going to be in trouble if it hits. So uh, default on the on getting the patch in as soon as possible. So if you've got the critical updates in, then the next thing you want to do is make sure you apply your other updates um, as quickly as possible. And you want to go through your regular change management process, whatever that is, making sure the business understands that, that you're going to make a change, why they're making the change, all that kind of stuff that you would normally do. If the device is capable, and if it, and if if you understand the risk, then you're going to configure automatic updates wherever it's feasible. That's the simplest thing to do. We do this with our Windows devices, or our Windows desktops. Uh, there's other devices out there that you can do this with. Just um, uh, just determine what the risk is, and the, you're trying to get the patch onto that device as quickly as possible. So uh, then you come to these things that are, is it a device? Well, it looks like a device. It works like a device, but is it a device? Is it a device? And this is where some of the cloud management stuff comes in. Um, we talk a little bit about Sase. 
And one of the things about SASE is that you have a device. Normally, you would con configure uh, the firewall. You go into the firewall and you update the firewall. But with SASE, you're not updating the firewall anymore. You're going to the cloud. You're going to create a rule. And then that device is going to reach out to the cloud and pull down whatever rules you created. So the, the, the process is slightly different now. But you still have a device. You still have to make sure that the uh, that A is actually picking up the controls that you have implemented in the cloud. So this is where it starts to get a little fuzzier. <laughs> um, again, uh, Azure Active Directory DS. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, you have an Active Directory on site. Microsoft now has a service where they can you build the Active Directory services in the cloud. The equivalent of your AD server, servers that were on site, they are built in the cloud. You don't have as much control over them, but you can do pretty well everything else that you do on-prem. And then on-prem, you'll have a, a, an AD, which is a secondary AD, um, a child AD, uh, AD server, and it's there for expedience. All the configuration actually happens in the cloud. So again, it wasn't. it's a device, it's on-prem, but you're not actually managing it from on-prem. So you have to do all those applied updates. You have to look and see what updates you need to apply, apply updates to the devices, but you're gonna do any of your software updates from the cloud. Again, Meraki is very much the same thing where you're configuring the, um, the, the access point or whatever, the firewall from the cloud and that gets pushed down to the device. So, and then you have devices in the cloud, like firewalls, actually uh, software-based firewalls in the cloud. You have one on-prem, you have one in the cloud. It looks like a, the configuration is very much like what you would do on on-prem. There's like parameters that you now have to, additional parameters you have to take into consideration because they're in the cloud. So you have to document what those additional configuration uh, settings have to be for the cloud service. So. Again, you go back to your asset register and you make sure you make a note of it. And when you run your checklist of things that you need to do, you make sure you ap apply the, the activities that are specific to that device that may exist in the cloud. Uh, you have to understand the difference between the cloud configuration and networking in the cloud, because there's things that if you were only on-prem, and you go to a hybrid environment like these devices are, you have to understand the nuance between networking in the cloud and networking on-prem. There is some differences uh, that I have, to, I have to help people through that process of understanding how networking in, in the cloud service works as opposed to networking on-prem. Not all the same rules apply. <laughs> um, we talk about the features may not be the same as on-prem. Again, there's some features in the cloud that you're gonna need to know that are gonna be different to on-prem. Um, I, I talked about you not having full control uh, on the cloud service. So there are times where you're not gonna have com full control, uh, AKA the Azure ADDS, but you have to understand what those limitations are and be able to handle those. Um, and then that's the, the sort of the, final point on this slide is that hybrid settings may be more complicated to administrate because now you're not only dealing with the device, you're also dealing with some of the controls within the cloud service itself that you have to understand and know and take into account. And then we get back to our mobile, our mobile devices. And our mobile devices, we're talking about notebooks, we're talking about mobile phones and tablets. The best advice I can give to anyone who wants to make sure that you have uniformity in device configuration or a secure configuration is to deploy a mobile device management or a mobile application management system. And there you have Intune, Jamf, uh, Manage Engine. There's a whole bunch out there. Uh, Black, Blackberry is one. They have uh, MDM. Um, because you are able then to uh, exercise your control over the devices. And now somebody's going to say, well, it's my device and I'm bringing it into the office. That's okay. <laughs> because all these MDM or M AM devices allow you to create like a virtual instance on that device. So my, my uh, mobile phone 
Uh, I use my mobile phone for work, but there's a sec. I, I use it, I have both a Google and an iOS machine because I have clients that use both. And so on my Google uh, phone, it creates a separate distinct uh, layer uh, or virtual machine that's only, that's managed by the corporation. Apple does it slightly different. Apple does it more the MAM type, which is they actually on the application. The application understands that there is an instance that is corporate. And so therefore you, when you go to open like your mail, you'll see that there's personal mail and now you'll see another um, selection that says corporate mail or whoever your company is mail. And therefore um, I can access both, but I, I can control whether the person, the two environments can interact to the MDM or MAM configuration. So you have a, the ability to configure whether they can use services other than the ones that you uh, you allow them to have. So I can deploy a whole suite of applications specific to the organization. The person leaves the organization, I just hit remove and, and then it disappears from both the iPhone and my uh, and the Google type Android device. Um, things that we can do to a mom and mom is that we can ensure that the device decryption is enabled. We can ensure that the pin is enabled. We can say that how long the pin has to be to access the environment. We can even set a pin for the corporate environment separate from the personal environment. Users don't like that because now they have to access another pin and we tend to just accept the pin that they're using for their, de for their device as long as it meets the business requirements of six, let's say six, six characters or six digits and th that's fine. So. Um, and then for high value uh, personnel, what I would say, the thing that I would recommend is you start to en enable uh, MFA with a FIDO key. So uh, we have uh, CFOs, we have presidents, we have CEOs. Uh, for, those or for those people, what we're saying that now you add an extra layer because those are high targets, especially for uh, wire transfers, uh, uh, wire transfer approvals. And uh, I, up to last week, I had a client that almost lost $500,000 in a wire transfer. And the only reason it wasn't successful is because they didn't have enough money in the account. <laughs> so, uh, so the thing is about this is for those high value customers, you want to probably add another layer of security on top of that. And FIDO keys are great. You can use them in a the desktop. You can use them on Apple phone. You can use them on Android as well. Um, Okay. And so now we get to those other things. I showed you a whole bunch of devices out there. Well, you're not going to have a device configuration, a secure device configuration for the car that's plugged in or the pump that's plugged in. So what you want to do for those devices that you have no control over is that you want to move those devices into a separate network, uh, segmented network. I use the word segregated here. You'll hear people use segregated and segmented. There's a slight difference in nuance between the two. A segmented network tends to be a, just a branch off and typically you're gonna use some kind of a router uh, to route the traffic between networks. Segregated networks now have a control activity going on. So you're not gonna allow every, all the traffic to go through. You're gonna now look, be looking at the traffic and you're gonna be determining what, tra what traffic needs to go through. So if, uh, if somebody, if you have a SQL server and it's in a segregated network and there's a user trying to access data, well, there should be a call to the secure data, uh, to the database. It should not be a call to the OS on that device. So therefore, you know, you can, con you can control what traffic goes through in a, seg uh, in a segregated network. You're probably looking at some kind of a firewall type structure to be able to inspect the traffic and to be able only allow the appropriate traffic through into that zone. Um, and then the other thing is you want, so that's the difference, that's a new, slight difference between a segregated and a segmented. And the, the point really about, I, I like to use segregated as opposed to segmented because now I can control access to the device that I talked about a minute ago. I want to be able to specifically allow certain traffic through to that segment and I know that they can't get onto the uh, onto to the administrator database unless they were coming from a completely different segment where the administrators live. 
So that's my talk for today. Um, like I said, uh, data perceptions, uh, we do risk, we risk assessments, that's right, risk assessments. So organizations just want to have, they basically we take that chart you saw with the, uh, asset reg uh, the asset register and we take and we go delve down into each asset and we build a, uh, uh, a risk matrix for that each asset. Uh, we do, uh, we help companies out with vision and trends. They don't necessarily want to do anything at this point. They just want to understand what's happening in the world out there. Obviously we do IT assessments for several, uh, several of the uh, frameworks, CSC, CMMC, ISO, NIST, whatever. Uh, I think we're looking at now, I think it's A5 for Europe because we have a lot of European countries. We are in uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. So we are in the midst of the high tech, uh, all these crazy things going on area. Uh, I, I myself, I live in Toronto. I work in Toronto and that's where all the financial businesses are. That's where I uh, spend a lot of my time. And we do, uh, we basically look at enabling uh, digital transformation. We look at security. We help a lot of people with cloud services and applying security in the cloud, deploying technologies in the cloud, trans moving from on-prem to cloud. We're doing a lot of that now. Uh, we're now doing a lot of this stuff because a lot of people are working from home. Uh, a lot of companies are now moving cloud-wise uh, and there's uh, the nuances of security in the cloud are, are, is now sort of coming top of, uh, top of the picture. And uh, like we said, we were one of the first, went through the pain of being the first organization to be certified under the CSC program. Uh, you have my, there's my contact information there and our company website. And with that, I have, I will be taking any questions that you may have about this or anything else you want to talk about. <laughs> uh, Richard, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, Richard, this is Ian from Kansas. Um, I, I saw your slide regarding uh, cloud security. Um, in, in your experience um, dealing with cloud security, do you know which platform will you recommend? AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, Azure? It all depends on your business. I have several customers that actually have all three. Um, uh, there, I have no preference. It depends on what your business wants to do. I, uh, multiple, many of my customers have more than one, at least two of those three. So I have no preference. Uh, whichever one you look at, what you're trying to do, you look at the what the each organization offers, and you pick the one that best fits. And one of the things that we do is help companies figure out which one, uh, based on what they're trying to do, um, works for them. I have a lot of clients that use Google. I have a lot of clients that use AWS, and, and I have a lot of clients that use uh, uh, Azure. Um, is for mostly e-commerce online store, similar to what Amazon is doing. Uh, we're just looking for a platform to to do the cloud. And uh, my question is, um, for for most of the staff who are beginner to cloud, uh, which platform will you recommend just for just for beginner to start with? Uh, you're putting me on the spot, and I I really cannot. I, I can't answer that question without understanding your business. It will be it will be really not professional of me to to be able to give you an answer based on when I don't know what your business is trying to do. I, I work I work in the tech um, um, area of Ontario, and I have a lot of companies that are tech. They some of them use Amazon, some of them use uh, Google. And I have a lot of companies that are sort of business, they're doing development in the, in the business area, and they tend to move to Azure. But uh, like I said, a number of them use multiple, uh, multiple clouds. Uh, uh, the, the, the days of just using one cloud may not be, uh, I, I just see a lot of them using multiple clouds. That's all I can say. So I can't, I'm, I'm not answering your question deliberately because I don't know what your organization is going to do and it will not be fitting for me to give you an answer that I don't have any uh, any perspective. Okay, i tell you what, uh, I'll probably uh, keep in touch with you and tell you more about the business. Sure, okay. Yeah. Thank you for the information, by the way. Okay. Perfect, thanks. So is there any other questions today? Just to tag on to the last one, would there be like differentiators, like just easy differentiators between the three? Um, 
you know, maybe a top three of what are the differentiators between them? Okay, so <laughs> um, let's start with Azure. Uh, Azure if you're uh, in business currently and you have a lot of Microsoft deployments within your architecture, then that will be the easiest path to go. If you are looking at the business, just basically business operations. If you're looking at development, there's, um, oh, you guys are putting me on the spot here. So we have a lot of companies that want some of the features that Microsoft has, but they don't want, uh, they're not a, in the, they want some cheap services. They don't, they don't need a full suite like what Microsoft has with Office and Word and Excel and all that stuff. I, I see those companies tend to drift to G Suite. Um, if they're if they if they're in, if they're all, if they're really interested in uh, just um, server power, they have some experience with Amazon. They 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 they, uh, they want to do like rapid deployments. Uh, a lot of come and because of their familiarity, since Amazon was the first one, a number of people use Amazon. When you get down to it, um, I can I I can deploy technologies in all three uh, equally. They're just done differently. It all depends on where your business is coming from, where your what your uh, your personal experience is. Um, what I'm not going to do is say which one is better and which one is worse because it all depends on what your business is trying to do. Oh, that's fair. Any more questions on the secure configuration? Did it make sense? Uh, did, was anybody surprised at the devices that we found on our networks when I do assessments? This is Brendan here. I, I can tell you, I'm, I wasn't surprised with your uh, the, the finding all those devices. We've had uh, customers uh, kind of provide feedback as they're doing the certification process that when they go through the scoping, they find uh, devices and software that they didn't even know were still there. Uh, in some instances, they were still paying licenses for and oh, yeah. it ended up saving money. <laughs> so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, scoping exercise when you when you go into the devices and and or the, the uh, software. Yeah, I've, I've found I've found devices like uh, uh, network connections for for a company they had bought the they had bought at least the present the the office space and what they were also paying for they didn't know was that they because of their address and stuff they were getting bills for uh, communication services that were coming to them because it existed previously and somebody was paying the bill but never understood why they were paying the bill they just saw this bill show up on their desk and they paid it every month until i started asking uh, what is this? Because <laughs> uh, I look, I look at all sorts of stuff. I look at bills. I look at uh, because nobody seems always. Uh, when I do these assessments, you have to understand that no one person seems to know what the answer is to all this stuff. So I have to ask the IT guys. I go and ask the business. I go and ask the person, the accounts payable, what the what bills they're paying, because all this helps you understand what services are in use. And a lot of times. No one person knows that stuff is in use. Uh, they're paying bills for it, and that's that's what helps me understand where get, to get, build that picture of all the all the things that are in on that asset register. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. Uh, is there anyone else with uh, any questions for Richard today? Uh, I said this is Jeff. I had a question. Just how how do you do uh, or count the with today's situation going across the country with so many employees working from home like how do you count uh their devices like a bring your bring your own device where it used to be bringing it in into the office but now they're all at home right um, like how, how do you account for all that now because they have to register a device before they get connected so even if you have your own device you have to sort of make declare it to before you can connect to use services remember i said they uh a mobile device manager or a mobile app application manager. Either way, we've, and before you can use the service, you have to basically say, register that device for the service. To say, this I want to use this device to get my email. So now I have a count and I know exactly what is connecting to my service. 
And you can only do that through a, some kind of mobile device manager. I know a lot of companies just allow people to connect to their email. I would recommend you not do that because you have no idea who is connecting. They might enter user ID and password, but that person could be at Brother Joe's uh, home using his Brother Joe's home computer, uh, or it could be Aunt Sally's computer. You don't know. But if they have to register that device, now I know what device is connecting it. So now I can discount them. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yep, yep, thanks. Any more questions? Any anything security you want to ask? Feel free. Um, <laughs> I got a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you, Richard, for the presentation. Oh, is there another question? Sure. Oh, I guess not. Well, uh, I actually have one. Maybe <clears throat> I'll squeak one in. So, uh, you had mentioned I forget what you said. It was an application manager. Would there be like or that last one you were? Uh, you were talking about about um, figuring out what devices are on your network. Would there be a difference or a pros or a cons between that versus like a network access control solution, kind of like Fortinac or Cisco ICE? Um, so yeah, or are they so, more so, of the same? Yeah. So, so no. So Cisco ICE is basically. So if I'm in the office and I connect. Uh, uh, it will register the device. And it's sort of the same. The big difference between a mobile a mobile device management system is that I can control the configuration of that device. It isn't just like, oh, uh, this person has uh, this antivirus slug. They, they had you so when you have when you go to the NAC type devices, you can say this person must have uh, this current this current antivirus. It must it, you, you, there's a bunch of must. They must have, right? Where with an MDM device, I'm saying uh, I can actually configure that device, and I can say, okay, uh, you got to get the up. Uh, I um, I can look at your um, what do you call it? Uh, I can look at your password configuration. I can now get into uh, device specific items specific to a device, where because uh, um, MDM understands the device, right? So where the NAC type, they look at a, a, a set of, I would say, parameters, the MDM can actually get on, on do some further integration of your device. And I can actually say, uh, okay, you can get this application because I can control what applications you have access to on that device. Remember I said that there's a corporate, basically a corporate virtual machine sitting on that personal, um, personally owned device. So I can say, oh, well, Joe, you can get Outlook, but you can't get Word. And I can I can remove that application from the device. Uh, when you when you go to the NAC type devices, they can only say, you must have this, you must have uh, antivirus, you must have at a certain level, you, you can you must have a certain things before you can connect. Where with the MDM, I can actually add uh, add applications to your device. Or I can remove applications from the device, but remember, this is only the corporate instance on the device, not the not the personal side. Does that answer oh. the question? Yeah. So I guess the difference would be um, if it was a NAC, it'd be the onus would be on the user to basically meet those parameters. Where the other one is, you could be proactive and then choose what goes on or what doesn't go on. I guess. Correct. Yes, okay. you you have control to be able to add applications, remove applications. So when they say remove and add, so let's say the Apple world, because the Apple world, they use the one application, but they have multiple instances on, on the application. So when you go to the Apple world, you'll see, uh, let's say your personal and you see corporate, right? And, and you can, and you toggle between those two. In the Google, you get the world, you get, you can do the same thing, because they have also a um, a MAM, a MAP, Microsoft, uh, uh, sorry, mobile application, which does the same, which works the same way as the Google, as the Apple environment does. So on your Outlook, you will have two different configurations. On on the Apple, on the Google side, I can also use a separate icon. I can deploy on your device a separate icon, which is Outlook. So the difference between the two is 
on the corporate side, you'll see Outlook with a little briefcase at the bottom right hand corner. And your personal side will have Outlook without, without a, uh, a briefcase. So now you know which one it is. Or you can do the same, or you can configure it the same way Apple does, where you where you go to Outlook and you'll see two different instances, two different profiles there, and you have to toggle between the two profiles. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. That's it. All right. Well, thank you for, for joining everyone. And uh, thank you, Richard. That was a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that there will not be a uh, webinar in December. Uh, we're going to take a break for the holidays, but we will be returning for uh, January. All right. Happy holidays, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining. Bye, everyone. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you.